suit that would be trumps. And what that means is that you could actually play a, a high card in another suit and someone could play the lowest card in the trump suit and they, that low card actually beat your high card. I feel like that if we're not careful as believers, we give Satan a trump card in our life. In other words, we're doing well, we're tithing, we're going to church, we're taking classes, we're in groups. But there's an area of our life that's not surrendered to the Lord. And here we are playing these high cards in, in other areas and Satan then throws down a trump card. Do you follow what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, we're out. We're, we, we've been, we, we, we're fall, we've fallen away, something's happened. And I think that the prodigal son had a, a trump card. So this is what I'm calling the trump card battle. Uh, let me say this too. I think sometimes we actually tell Satan uh, what, what's a trump in our life. In other words, I, I've actually heard people say something like, you know, if, if that ever happened to me, I don't think I could keep serving God. I've heard, I've heard people say, uh, you know, if my husband did this, that would be the end of our marriage. Okay, wh why would you say that? Because do you understand what your enemy does then? Your enemy says, thank you. Because, you know, I was working on your husband in like five different areas. But now I know all I have to do is work on him in that one area. So don't, don't give Satan any trump cards. You have to know that if he has a trump card, it's because you gave it to him. Because Jesus took away the whole deck 2,000 years ago. I mean, he took away all of Satan's power unless we open a door to him unless we give him some yield in an area. So let me show you three, three areas that could be uh, trump cards from the story of the prodigal son. Uh, number one, secrets. Secrets. Let me read you just a little from Luke 15, all right? Verse 11 says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. This is the beginning of the parable. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, verse 13 is what I want to key on and not many days after. Not many days after. The younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Okay, what does that phrase, not many days after, tell us? Here's what it tells us. It tells us that he was planning it. It tells us that he had this going on in his heart and in his mind before he got the inheritance, and that's why he was asking for it. He, he had a secret. The secret was that he thought he would be happy if he had money. Let, let me talk to you about these secrets. They're, they're thoughts in our heart. They're thoughts in our mind. They're thoughts that the enemy might plant or that we allow him to, to build a case in our mind. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 says to cast down imagination. Some versions use different words. <laughs> But that's probably the best word from, from the Greek. And I want you to think about what the root of the word imagination is. Uh, we would think imagine, but it's actually uh, smaller than that. It's image. It, it, it's an image that we magnify is what it is. Uh, and let me tell you what the word image means. And, and it's really easy to actually understand. It comes from a Latin word. But image means image. Think, here's what it means. I make. I make, and, 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 and the root of it actually means I become. Let me say it another way. What you're picturing in your mind, you're becoming. We, we've heard people say this, picture it in your mind. Well, well, here's what the Bible, the way the Bible says it, as a man thinks in his heart. So these are the deep thoughts of your heart that go into your mind. So is he. No, don't have a, a picture in your mind of something that's, that's ungodly. Uh, don't, in other words, don't imagine a good marriage with someone else other than whom you're married to. And imagine a good marriage with the person you already have. Imagine that. Don't, don't, don't imagine being rich one day. Imagine being generous now. <laughs> in other words, you've got to put the right thoughts in your mind. And the prodigal son had different thoughts, and they, they were secrets. He, he, didn't know, he never told anyone this. He had a secret. And as soon as he got the funds, he fulfilled his secret. 
Uh, let me show you a little uh, about secret. I'll get to Genesis 25 in a minute. But Genesis 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, form and void and darkness. Notice the word darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, I just want you to notice something. God didn't create the darkness. The darkness was already there. Most theologians believe it's because Satan had already fallen to the earth. And he, so Satan lives in darkness. So God never said, let there be darkness. And God never said the darkness was good. God said, let there be light, and that light was good. Show you another scripture on darkness, Jude 6. It says, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within their limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged, and God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. So Satan is, lives in darkness. These, these are fallen angels. They're, that's demonic spirits. They live in darkness. So let me ask you a, just a simple question. Where are secrets? <laughs> They're in the darkness. The best thing you can do with a secret like this that the enemy is trying to get you to imagine is to bring it into the light. Get it out of the darkness. You understand when you turn a light switch on, there's no fight. There's no wrestling. When you turn the light switch on, darkness and light aren't wrestling. Light immediately expels darkness. Immediately. You, you have already, uh, you're already on the way to winning the battle a long way down the road by simply bringing anything that is in the dark to the light. Um, I, uh, I had a friend of mine that not long after we started Gateway Church, um, I found out that he had fallen morally and he ended up losing, uh, leaving his, fa his wife and losing his family. I don't, I don't say that obviously with any joy, it broke my heart. But as I talked to him about it, he, he felt like he actually loved this other woman. And he told me about, I, I've really connected with her. And I've shared things with her I've never shared with my wife. And, and there's a, a real deep emotional connection. And he said, I, I'm in love with her. And I said to him, of course you are. Because you did with her what you should have done with your wife. You connected emotionally with her. And, and I was uh, thinking about, what, what was the trump card in his life? Because it was right when he was stepping into this, the, the call of God on his life in a greater way. And the trump card was that we, we, we kind of knew that they never, she kind of went her way and he kind of went his way. And there wasn't a lot of emotion between them. But we just thought that was their personality. We thought that's the way they were. But the trump card was he never connected emotionally. He, you know, he say, was saying to me, I've opened up and I've shared things with this other woman. He should have been doing that with his wife all along. And if he had connected with her emotionally, he would have fallen in love with her. But what I'm saying is that he probably believed this is the way I am, this is the way she is. But Satan was holding that little card that was just a two. And he was just holding it. And when my friend really stepped in to a productive call of God on his life, Satan went just like that. So don't, don't have a, a secret. Here's the second Trump card, I think, from the prodigal son is sin. Hey, we, we know that he, he went into sin, uh, the word prodigal meaning, uh, you know, without restraint. And, and it has the implications of, of that he had, the older brother said later, that drinking and, and, and with, with um, uh, immorality and all these things. Okay, please hear me. That was already going on in his heart. Now, Genesis 25, if you're there. Uh, look at verse 29. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew. And Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. The word Edom simply means red. That's what it means. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold 
his birthright to Jacob. Now, this is amazing. This is, this is a little more than what we might think by just reading the words on the page. And the New Testament actually quotes this and says, don't be like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Don't, don't do that. Okay. The birthright was, was phenomenal in the Jewish culture. We, we don't understand that, most of us from the culture that, that, we've, where, that we grew up in. We don't understand it. The, 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 uh, we, we talk about the inheritance, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it was so much more than that. It, it was the honor of being the firstborn. It was the honor of being the patriarch of the family one time. They would have big dinners, the firstborn, always set by the father, the patriarch. The patriarch then would make speeches, but he would, even when the, the firstborn was young, he would ask him to say something at these dinners, implying this is the next patriarch of the family. This is the one. The, the firstborn could actually borrow money simply on his name. And no other child could do that. But he could do it because he was simply the firstborn. He was automatically made an elder in the gates of the city simply because he was the firstborn. And then we, we, most of us know about the inheritance. He received twice as much inheritance, double what any other child in the family would receive, double. So it, it wasn't just the financial, but it was the honor. And Esau gives it up for a bowl of stew. Now, he, here's what's amazing about this is uh, the Bible likens this, though, to sexual sin in, in the New Testament when it quotes it. Because most of us would think, well, I, I'd never give up my birthright for food. But what about fleshly, any fleshly appetite? Because I know people who've given up everything for one short moment of gratification. And they've given up their marriage and their family and their kids and their grandkids and their business and the call of God on their life for one fleshly appetite. And that's what this is talking about. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't go that way. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. It costs you more than you wanted to pay and requires more than you wanted to give. It always does. That's the way sin is. And here was this prodigal son that gave it up. And, and please hear me when I say the firstborn. I hope you're relating this. Romans 8 says that Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. Let me tell you what, what he did for you. He made you the firstborn of God also. In other words, here, here's what Romans 8 says. He was the firstborn of many. The firstborn of many. So you have all the rights and privileges of the firstborn, of the Father who created everything. And that's what sin does. It causes us to give it up. Um, I'm going to deal with briefly, just briefly, a difficult passage of Scripture. Several times in the Old Testament, God would say, when you, when you go in to conquer this land, kill them all, uh, even the children. And that's a, that's a difficult passage for many believers to get around but you have to know a couple of things. One is you have to know these nations had been given a chance to repent. God had given them through uh, Joseph one time, uh, through Joshua another time. God had given them the chance to turn to him and repent. And they had said, we, no, we do not accept you. And they'd continue in their false worship and idols. God told Saul to destroy all of the Amalekites, but he didn't do it. You know what happened to Saul? His entire life, he fought with Amalekites, and he died in an Amalekite battle. Now, so, so why would God say kill the little ones? Listen to me, because little ones grow up. Now, these were enemies of God, and they had rejected God. So you have to understand that, and I don't have time to go into all the theology of this passage and explain that God's still a good God. But 1 Corinthians 10 tells us everything in the Old Testament represents something to us. Little ones grow up. Here, here, here's why I'm saying this. People will say, well, pastor, I don't have a big sin in my life. I just have a few little ones. 
Little ones grow up. And if you don't kill those little sins, they'll come back and kill you. And here's the third trump card, shame. Here's the reason I say this. Uh, Shame is the result of the fall. The very first thing that Adam and Eve felt after they fell was shame. It's the first thing they felt. They hid from God. They had no reason to hide from God. Can you imagine? I know God knows everything, but God's a person. He has joy, the Bible tells us. He grieves. How do you think God felt? Walking through the garden that day. And he never given his children any reason to hide from him. Never given them any reason to be afraid. And they said we were afraid, so we hid. Shame. We knew we were naked, so we hid. They, they felt shame. First time ever. Every person goes through shame. So let me tell you about the prodigal. Think about this. Comes home and he gets the party. And I just want to ask you a question. Maybe you never thought of this. How do you feel after the party? How do you feel for the rest of his life? You, I, now, I'm not saying that he had a problem with this. But I'm telling you, in my own life, it's been a battle. I mean, I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. I know the Father receives me back. And I don't carry shame, but I'm still ashamed of the life that I lived at one time. Here's another thing that people, I, I don't think, think about this story. His inheritance was gone. See, we don't, we don't think about that. We think well, everything, everything was great. Yes, his relationship with his father was restored, but his inheritance was gone. You know, he, he couldn't go back to the bar owners and say to the bar owners and the prostitutes, um, I've repented. And um, so, you know, I was here a few years ago, and I spent that money in your bar, and, but, but I've repented. And um, I'm, I'm actually the, the prodigal in Luke 15. Maybe you've read the story. <laughs> That's me. And uh, so now that I've repented, I want you to give me the money back. Do you think any of the bar owners said, sure? That inheritance was gone. Here's what I'm saying. Yes, I'm loved. Yes, I'm forgiven. But I deal with some things that God never intended me to deal with because I lived a sinful life. I deal with images that my wife has never had to deal with. I saw things that I never should have seen. I did things I never should have done. I have images, I have memories. Yes, you can be healed. Yes, you can live a great, uh, joyful life. I was just, yesterday I was in the outdoors and I was just just blown away at God's creation and how good God is. So I I don't live with shame, I, I live with joy. But I've had a battle. Hey, anyone relate to me? Y'all are looking at me like you're pious or something. <laughs> okay, don't be pious in church. <clears throat> All right, let me, let me help you a little bit. So I've never felt shame. Let me tell you, there are two types of people that feel shame. Those who deal with pride and those who deal with insecurity. You ever dealt with either? And this is, this, you say, well, why is, why is that a trump card? Because Satan holds it. And he knows that you still carry shame. And as soon as you start to do something for God, he says, uh, uh, don't, don't step out. Because I'll bring your past out. As soon as you start really serving God, he says, oh, wait, wait, wait. Don't forget about this. That's the way he is. So what's, what's, what's the answer? If you're in Hebrews 12, let me read you a couple scriptures. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's referring back to chapter 11, what we call the hall of faith. All these great men and women of God. We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside, let us lay aside every weight. Let me say it another way. Every secret, every sin, all the shame. The sin which so easily ensnares us. 
And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. How are we going to do it? <laughs> looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. The author and the what? Finisher. Boy, you just can't imagine what good news that is that I don't have to finish it. But he who started a good work in me will complete it. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Watch this. Despising the shame. He took our shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Listen to this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. We're in the process. Not We've received salvation. It's past tense. We're also being converted. We're being changed into the image of Christ. It is, the cross is the power of God. Okay. So how, how, how am I going to get rid of these trump cards? Go to the cross. See, you don't just go to the cross to get saved one time. You do get saved, and it's a beginning, and you are born from above, and it's a spiritual birth, and it's a work that God does. But as a believer, to those of us who believe, the cross is the power of God. Of God. I keep taking my secrets to the, to the cross. I keep taking my sin to the cross. I keep taking my shame to the cross. And you need to know something about the cross. Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Okay. Um, the cross today has honor because of what Jesus did. We, we, we have jewelry with crosses. Uh, we, we have um, decorations on our wall. We put crosses. Okay, the cross today has honor. You have to remember when Jesus said, pick up your cross, take up your cross, it had no honor. <laughs> no honor and no glory then. It was a symbol of shame. It would be like Jesus said, follow me to the gallows and die with the rest of the criminals. No, 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 no glory at all. But it has glory because of this. So here's what I'm going to tell you about the cross. The cross is still the answer. It's still the answer to go to the cross every day, to place my sin and my secrets and my shame on the cross. And since I'm using the trump card analogy, and I've already offended several of you with this analogy, I'm sorry. But since I'm using it, you need to know something. Satan holds that little two of spades. But God holds the ace of spades. And it's the cross. And when Satan says to God, look at all Robert's done wrong, God says, look at all my son did right. Look at all my son did right for him. And because of the cross, God would say it this way, Satan, listen to me. He's free and he's forgiven. You want, a, you want a trump card? I've been holding on to it right here. It's called the cross of Jesus Christ. So you come to the cross, you give him your life, and you're going, you're doing great, and all of a sudden, an imagination comes in your mind. Sin starts to come and work, and you start thinking like the prodigal did. If he had a chance, not many days after, you might go down that road. The answer is to always turn to the cross. Isn't it amazing? Jesus played the highest trump card that could ever be played on the cross for you and me. But I want to encourage you, don't let Satan hold on to some little card in your life, a secret or a sin or even shame from your past, and then play that one day and get you out of the game. Take it right now and confess it to the Lord. Put it up. I shared in the series, I've shared two, but the first one I called it the believer's battle. This message I'm calling the brother's battle. The brother's battle. Now there are two sons in this story that Jesus told about the prodigal son. There's the prodigal son, obviously, but then there's the older brother. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, uh, so don't raise your hand, but... Some of you, how many of you, don't raise your hand, I shouldn't say it, I shouldn't ask. Some of you relate more to the older brother 
in the story than the prodigal son. That's my wife, Debbie. She would relate more to him because she's never left home. She got saved at nine, and uh, she's never left home. And she will tell you very quickly, I relate more to the prodigal son, obviously. So um, we're a good team. Uh, But the reason I didn't ask you to raise your hands is because those of you who relate more to the older brother would embarrass those of us that, you know, don't relate to the older brother. We'd be like, yeah, I guess I do, but... It's church, I don't want to lie, you know. So, um, so I want to talk to you about the brother's battle. And what I mean by that is, what about how he felt that he's the one that didn't leave home and the one that did leave home and squandered his father's inheritance was getting the party? And how do we feel toward prodigals And how do we feel toward people who are struggling with sin in their life, maybe a sin that we don't struggle with? How do we feel? And so Jesus tells this parable to help us understand. So let me show you a little bit about the older brother here. Luke 15, uh, verse 25. And you'll keep your Bibles there. We're actually going to go to, to some other passages in Luke. Luke 15, verse 25 says, Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. By the way, that's really good dancing when you can hear it. (laughs) So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he, that's the father, has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he, the older son, was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he, this is the older son, answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. Now, underline two words here. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Okay. So what's the brother's battle? The brother's battle is keeping our heart right when the father is rejoicing over the sinners coming home. That's the battle. It's not allowing jealousy or envy or anger or bitterness to come in. Even when the prodigal is gone and hasn't come home yet. Think about the father standing on the front porch, maybe every night, looking for his younger son and the older son looking at his father and beginning to believe the lies of the enemy. That the father was mistreating him because he was loving the one that was in sin even more. Um, There are three parables in Luke 15. The, The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And many people don't even know why Jesus told these three parables. Let me, let me show you. If you go to verse one, Luke 15, verse 1, it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. The whole reason he he told the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son was because the Pharisees were upset that he was receiving sinners sinners. So let me tell you what the, the, the brother's battle will do. Here, here's three things. Here's number one. It affects how we see ourselves. It affects how we see ourselves. Uh, I read the verse a moment ago, but verse 29, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Okay, that's a lie because he was human. Uh, What about the verse, all have sinned? What about the verse, there is none righteous, no, not one? Listen, the only son that can say, I never transgressed your commandment at any time is Jesus. No other person can make that statement. But that's the way he saw himself. I had someone tell me one time, he said, I've always done the right thing. And things haven't worked out for me like you. I've always done the right thing. I said, really? Always? 
But that's the way he thought. That's the way he saw himself. That was the problem with the older son. All right, look at Luke 18, maybe just a page or two to your right. Luke 18, verse 9. Jesus said also he spoke this, it says also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And watch what happens when you trust in yourself and believe in your own righteousness and despised others. That's the battle. That's the brother's battle. If you begin to trust in your own good works and your own righteousness, you'll begin to despise others. Two men, this is what Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Now, stop just for a moment. You maybe have never said that audibly. But have you ever had that thought? Thank you, I'm not like other people. That's a Pharisee. That's a Pharisee. I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Notice the emphasis is on what he does. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this is Jesus talking, this man went down to his house justified, saved, justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the, the battle is trusting in your own righteousness. That's the battle. You, you understand, no new believer has this battle. And you say to a new believer, you know, it's just God's grace. They say, don't I know it. <laughs> but 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, they're now a leader. They've now gone through the classes. They're now teaching others. You say to them, it's all grace. Oh, well, yeah, but, you know, I've done a lot of things for God. You've just opened a door to the enemy you don't want to open. Because he's so happy that you're proud of your righteousness. And he's going to come in and he's going to start causing you to see yourself differently than the way you should look at yourself. It doesn't matter if it's low self-esteem or high self-esteem or esteem itself. The focus is on yourself rather than on Christ. And when the focus is on you, you're always losing the battle. The focus has to be on Christ. If you have a good week, thank God. If you have a bad week, thank God. Because the focus has to be on him. Uh, years ago, Pastor Olin Griffin, uh, who was pastor of Shady Grove and my pastor and one of our apostolic elders, he was going to preach for a, a pastor in Oklahoma. And so I rode up with him. And we got up there and, and the pastor then, we got in the car with him to go to lunch. And he was taking us around and he said to Pastor Olin, he said, you know, um, the church is struggling right now. He said, we've kind of plateaued, and um, I know it's my fault. And Pastor Olin has a way sometimes that he'll do a little shock therapy, you know, on people. And uh, he said to him, you know, uh, I think you're the most arrogant person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> the pastor said, what do you mean? I just told you that the church is struggling, and you tell me that I'm arrogant? And here's what he said to him. Well, if you take the blame when the church isn't doing well, you'll take the credit when it is doing well. And that's pride. See, again, the focus is not supposed to be on us. It's supposed to be on Christ. This is the brother's battle. It'll affect the way you see yourself. Here, here's the second battle. It affects the way you see others. If you'll flip back to Luke chapter 7, it, it affects how we see others. Luke chapter 7, look at verse 36. It says, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. By the way, this is not Mary. This is not John's sister. This is another instance, all right? 
This was a, a, a prostitute, is what the scripture indicates. And she stood at his feet, verse 38, behind him, not in front of him, behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, now watch these words carefully, he spoke to himself. Okay, another way to say that is he thought. He thought. He spoke to himself. Okay, he wasn't speaking out loud. They take you away when you speak out loud to yourself, all right? So he's speaking to himself, thinking. And listen, what, what, watch what he thought. This man... If he were a prophet, now remember those words, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, before we read on, I want you to think about this. He is thinking, he's thinking, if he were a prophet, okay, watch the next three words, and Jesus answered. I would say he's a prophet. <laughs> You know, if you're thinking something and Jesus says, uh, hey pal, let me, let me answer your thoughts right now. And what's funny is he's thinking if he were a prophet, I think that puts it to rest, he's a prophet. He can hear your thoughts, right? Obviously he's God, so he knows what you're thinking. So Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors one owed 500 denarii, that's a, den a denarii is a day's wages, denarius is one day's wage, so 500 denarii be the plural, and the other 50. So one owes about a year and two thirds wages, one owes about one sixth of a year wages, if you like math, if you, some of you, like my wife, could not care less, I said that statement right there. Anyway, 550, okay? And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, this is Jesus talking, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, watch Jesus talking, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now, this is a passage that most people, I think, misunderstand. They think that it teaches that people owe God different amounts, and a person who owes God more will actually love God more. Okay, that is not what this is teaching at all. You have to remember that he's answering Simon's thoughts. This passage does not teach that there are some people who have been forgiven more it's, let me say it another way. This passage does not teach that there are some people who are better than others. It teaches that there are some people who think they are better than others. That's what it teaches. It doesn't teach that there are some people who are worse than others. It teaches that there are some people who think that there are people who are worse than they are. He used the amounts because he's answering Simon's thoughts. But if you read the scripture, the Bible says if you've broken one commandment, you've broken them all. We all owe the same. It costs the blood of Jesus for all of us. What he's saying to Simon is because you think that you didn't owe me much, you love little. But if you understood that you owe me as much as she owes me, then you'd love me a lot. Say, it's not at all saying that you need to go out into the world and sin so that you'll love God more. It's saying that you need to understand the price that he paid for you. See, this, this brother's battle is that you not only see yourself differently, you see others differently. Let me say it another way. If you look up to you, you'll look down to others. And that was the problem here with this Pharisee. And that was the problem with the older brother. So it affects how you see others. Here's number three. 
it affects how we see the Father. It affects how we see the Father. Why did Jesus tell these parables? See, the emphasis is on that someone lost something precious. The shepherd lost a sheep, the woman lost a coin, and a father lost a son. The whole reason that he told these three parables is to tell you how much the father is grieving that he has lost something precious. That's why he's telling these. And the problem is that this son didn't get it. Hey, you remember there was another never. He said, you, you never, you, I never transgress your commandment. Here's another. He said, you never even gave me one goat. You never even gave me a goat. Okay, that's a lie. Just like the other one was a lie. Let me, let me read it to you. Back in Luke 15, verse 11 says, Then he said to them, a certain man had two sons. Watch your Bible very carefully. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Watch. So he divided to what? One more time. <laughs> them. His livelihood. But I just read that that son said, you never even gave me a goat. He gave him his inheritance. And by the way, the inheritance of the firstborn was twice. Double. Twice as much. He got twice as much as the other son, but because he didn't see himself correctly, and didn't see others correctly, he didn't see the father correctly, and he said, you never even gave me one goat. Never one goat. Look, look at the father's response, verse 31. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Okay, you're always with me represents the presence of God, and all that I have is yours represents the provision of God. Here's what he said. He said, son, you have my presence and you have my provision. Here's the problem. The younger son missed out on the presence and the provision of the father because he left home. The older son missed out on the presence and the provision of the father because he left home in his heart. He never left home physically like the younger son did. He sat in church every week, but he allowed uh, insecurity and fear and anger and bitterness and envy and jealousy to build up in his heart toward the father and toward his brother, his own brother. It's just amazing to me. So how do you, how do you, how do you keep this? How do you win the... The, the, the brothers battle. Because see, we all want to become older brothers and sisters, right? We all want to become older brothers and sisters. And we want to be a good older brother and sister, right? Let me, let me just show you how a guy named Paul did it, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles. He says, because I persecuted the church, not even worthy to be called an apostle. He calls himself the least of the apostles 10 years before he dies, Seven years later, which is three years before he died, he writes Ephesians 3.8 and says, to me, the very least of all saints. Saints. First he calls himself the least of all apostles. Seven years later, he calls himself the least of all saints. Two years later, which is one year before he died, he wrote 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, watch, of whom I am chief. So he calls himself the least of all the apostles. Then years later, he calls himself the least of all the saints. Then he calls himself the chief of all sinners. He's going the right way in his opinion of himself. <laughs> How? This is the guy that said, I die daily. This is the guy that said, I'm crucified with Christ. This is the guy that said, I nail my fleshly desires to the cross. This is the guy that said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I have decided to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. You know, when he made that statement, of all the sinners, Christ is a great savior, he said, and of all the sinners, I'm the chief. It reminds me of John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace who was a, is a for, was a former slave ship captain. He went blind in his later life, and he made this statement that they recorded. He said, there are two things that I still see clearly. 
Christ is a great Savior, and I am a great sinner. Christ is a great Savior, and I am a great sinner. Paul, one year before he dies, says, I'm the chief of all the sinners. It's only the cross. The only way you're going to win this battle is staying close to the cross. It's the only way. I want to tell you one last thing. That parable that we read in Luke 7 about, you know, those who have been forgiven little love little. Many, many people again believe that, believe that I never loved God because I wasn't in a lot of sin. Can't love God. My wife believed that. Because of that passage, she misunderstood it. She believed I can never love God as much as Robert because he was redeemed out of the pit. And I see this love for God, and here I was saved at nine, never left the church, and, and Jesus said it. I've been forgiven little, so I can only love little. She's wrestling with that passage. And one day in worship, she's standing in worship, and please be open to this. God can so speak to you in worship. And she sees in her mind, I would call it a vision, but many times in the church we think, well, that's something spooky or something. No, God can show you something, a picture in your mind, and it can be from God. She all of a sudden saw herself in a white wedding dress, and she knew she was the bride of Christ. And she saw Jesus standing a, a little bit away from her, and she took off running to him, and all of a sudden she just tripped and fell in a mud hole. And there was mud all over her. She said, there was none of my dress. You couldn't see any white on my dress. You couldn't see any of my skin, none of my face even, and it was all caked in my hair. I was completely, 100% covered in mud. She said, I was on all fours in that mud hole, and I was so just devastated because I was muddy as a bride. And she began to think about, God brought to her mind attitudes that she had, even as a child, that were sinful. And she started just realizing how sinful she was with horrible attitudes and things that God dealt with her about. And even times of rebellion, sometimes silent rebellion. And she said, I was so broken and all of a sudden, when I opened my eyes in this vision, in this mud hole, she said, I saw a nail-scarred foot standing on top of the mud. You know, he can walk on water. He can walk on mud. She said, no mud on his foot. And he had come to me. And I followed it up, and he was in a white robe, and he was putting out a nail-scarred hand. And she said, I slipped my hand up, and when I put it in his hand, the mud just went completely off of me, all the way down. And when it got to my feet, the mud hole turned into gold. And he lifted me up, and I was completely clean. And I danced on golden streets with my groom. And I knew that he had cleansed me. And she said, I knew then that the same grace that got Robert out of sin kept me from ever going into sin. And I knew I could love Jesus as much as Robert did. We don't want to be that older brother that looks down on someone when he or she comes back to the Lord. We've got to keep our hearts right before God. I want to do something that I very seldom do, and that is I want to encourage you to order this series.